going to be a tough road. I know that Mike Terza wants to run for governor, and he's the speaker. Um, you know, um, that, that's a dynamic, and maybe it'll, maybe it'll work with. But uh, anyway, I'll stop. Thank you. Former uh, super lobbyist Jack Abramoff uh, once said, when you give a human being a gift, the natural response is to want to write a thank you note to, to return that gratitude. And that that's perfectly okay on Christmas morning, and it's perfectly okay on birthdays, but not when you're a public servant. Adam Lincoln, you uh, recently co-wrote a book with Francis Morlopay about um, meaning and democracy and, and the intersection of, of that. And there's a phrase in that book called uh, the thrill of democracy. And I'd just like for you to kind of articulate what, what does that mean? What, what is the thrill of democracy? Well, I think that, you know, there's a great Churchill expression that goes along the lines of democracy is the worst form of government except all others. Um, but see, I and Frankie, you know, Refer to Francis Wallace as Frankie because that's how she likes to be called. And she says, "If you can handle it," and so I'll, I'll call her that. Um, we reject that, um, not in the sense of democracy is the worst form of government. Period, but because we don't think democracy uh, should be disparaged in that way. Because we honestly believe that for humans to really thrive, uh, they need to need three essential things, and it's, it's a sense of connection with others. Um, meaning, meaning that you, you can you do something good with your life beyond yourself, and the sense of power, which is the agency through which to, to enact that. Um, and democracy these days, uh, not in, in the way we conceive of democracy now, of, you know, uh, you vote once uh, every two or four years, or if you're really good, once a year, um, but really something more than that. And it was really when Frankie and I were marching last year in Democracy Spring that we realized that uh, there was something really powerful about what we were doing. And we spent a lot of time talking over coffee and peanut butter and jelly sandwiches on the march about what was it exactly that we were experiencing during that long walk uh, that maybe some of the marchers here will also be able to identify with. But what was it that felt so good? Um, and we, we put together three, three concepts that we, we think you know, begins to capture what, what that means for us. And, and the first is, is a sense of courage. It's called civil courage. It's, it's walking with fear. It's the, the, the idea that, that sometimes things are scary, but instead of that fear pushing you away, it's something that uh, you, know, you can, if you overcome it, you can then overcome the next thing, the next thing. And democracy is scary. Protesting is scary. Walking is scary. You don't think you can walk 100 miles, but when you do, you can walk 140. You can go to lobby your legislature. You know, there are a lot of, I've heard a lot of stories already about you know, the first time experiencing uh, going to meet with your representative. And the idea is very scary. Uh, but once you do it, you realize, no offense, but you're just an ordinary human being. Uh, and that's really important to understand. And that's something that's been lost. Um, and the second is, is uh, a sense of, of solidarity, of community, of walking with people you would never have met otherwise. Um, people who are just different than you, not in a, in, a, in a great way. People who come from different areas, who live in very isolated bubbles. That's just kind of how things have developed in American society. And, you know, for better or worse. Um, but coming together and marching with people for, you know, for 10 days, um, like all of us are doing. Uh, and and it, it creates friendships, it creates uh, intense meaning over the course of that time. Um, and that's powerful. And 72% of Americans report lonely, to be lonely. Um, that's an epidemic. Um, that's something that's really serious. But engaging in politics together um, is a great way to, to overcome that and give, give meaning to your life and to give you a safety net, which a lot of people don't have. A lot of people don't feel like they have. A lot of people have friends, but how many friends would go on a market with you for a common purpose? Um, and it, it's kind of getting at that, which I think is really important. And, and the last one is what we originally called the thrill of democracy. Um, and it's, it's, the, it's the idea of being the grown-up in the room. Um, 
The idea of coming together as we the people and saying we have solutions. Um, you know, Democracy Spring, when we got there on the final day and walked from uh, the last stop into DC, we saw the Capitol and we were chanting, whose democracy? Our democracy. And we were overcome with the sense of, yeah, it, it is our democracy. It's our, it's our government. You know, damn it, this is our government. Um, you know, these, these congressmen and women are just people like us. And, you know, they're gonna listen to us. Um, and that's power. And when you lose sight of that, uh, bad things happen. But regaining that is, is, a, is a really emotionally powerful thing. Um, and so for us, it's really digging into those concepts. Um, and, and, and our book itself is, is exploring, exploring that, as well as being heavily influenced by Zach's book and a lot of other great books that have recently come out about the problems of democracy, that the, there really has been this kind of concerted, coordinated assault on democracy by really just a, a few group of people. I mean, this, this really isn't, you know, perpetuated by a large number of people. So it's not as if, you know, the majority of Americans support this, you know, these legislations that are passing. It really is a minority, and it's a minority that's very well heavily financed. Um, and the, the goal is to overwhelm public opinion. 85% um, of Americans want fundamental change in the way we finance our elections. Um, but nothing happens. Um, you know, and, and there are many reasons for that, and we can go into that. Um, but the, the other real reason why we sat down to write a book that I think is really important, and I'm going to deviate a little bit from the question, but I really do want to address this, is that whether, you know, I was talking to Zach about this before, that a lot of people don't, a lot of, in the media doesn't cover democracy issues. No one, no one is covering the, the people were buried. Really, only Zach and, and, and Ari Berman of the Nation were covering these the kind of proliferation of these really awful voter ID bills in 2012, 2013. Uh, it's not always the sexiest issue, um, and, and as well as that, people aren't covering those who are out there fighting day in and out, like Carol, um, and on the good government side, and like our wonderful representative here, um, you know, inside the government. Um, we're trying to fight to overcome those things and to make democracy more of a place where you can have meaningful connection and, and really have the, the will of the people heard. And there is a movement for democracy. I, I truly believe there is a capital D, capital M democracy movement all across the nation. Um, in the past year, there have been over 20 ballot initiatives that passed, just in 2016, uh, regardless of what you think of the outcome. Uh, out of 17 ballot initiatives across the country, explicitly just for democracy, 14 of them passed. And one of them barely lost. I mean, we're talking less than a percentage. Um, so people are fighting back. Uh, whether it's Democracy Spring, whether it's the people passing automatic voter registration in Oregon, whether or not it's the March on Harrisburg. Uh, people are, are fighting back. And it, 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 these local state you know, uh, actions are not isolated. I mean, that, that's the key. The key is that this is not these aren't isolated actions. Just because you're working on a local level or a state level, you're part of a capital D, capital N democracy movement. And we have to reconceptualize our role as part of a broad-based movement to raise the voices of everyone else. And it's happening. It's already happening. The question is just how do we move forward and how do we expand it? Thank you. of somebody else that they respond from a place of service and they respond from a place of responsibility. And when they are unable to see the face of the other, they respond from a place of selfishness and uh, of indifference. Um, there's a philosopher, uh, Emmanuel Levinas, who has a quote, when you see the face of the other, you are ordered and ordained to service. To go to a, a rally on a Sunday afternoon, you know, a climate march type thing, you know, to show up for on a beautiful sunny day, it's, it's easy. Um, but it's not easy, but it's, it's very doable. Um, but to wake up on a Tuesday morning when it's rainy and get to work, you know, to fight gerrymandering or to expose uh, voter intimidation or, or voter corruption, um, it, it's, you need to be responding from a place of, of service, of responsibility, of, of obligation. And this is a, a very personal question, um, and I would just like to close to all the panelists, uh, whoever would like to answer it. 
But what is the face that, that you have in front of you that, that gets you out of bed in the morning? Who, who are you fighting for? Who are you obligated to? Who are you responsible toward? I often wonder 
wonder why I decided to focus on this issue. Um, I grew up in New York City in a relatively middle to affluent family. Um, so there's really no reason why I, I, I would be focusing on this. Um, I, I had every reason not to, right? Uh, this is not like what most of my classmates do. Um, more conventional path is to go work on Wall Street or go to a law firm um, and have a very nice life. Um, but, but uh, you know, um, I, I think from a very young age I was really struck by how when I went to school in the morning, at a great school, um, I would always see people who were homeless asking for money. And I think that really shook me from a young, a, a young age. Because um, I don't think I really understood it. And I never really lost that, that face. And, and I never really uh, was able to forget that. Um, some of my peers kind of were able to be socialized in a way that you, you, you begin to lose the, the faces. You see, they become kind of obscure blobs of human matter. Um, but I don't know why, but I, I just I could not. Um, and it's really still pains me to this day that in, in a city like New York that has so much wealth, uh, there are people who have nothing and get just spit on. And I said, well, where's their voice? Why, why are they not heard? Why are they not seen? Uh, why are they not treated as human? Um, and, and over time, you know, it, it, it's just gotten worse in a lot of ways. I mean, seeing, you know, young African Americans killed in the street, uh, they're not heard. Um, they're slaughtered. Um, or the environment, um, or on any issue. Um, and what I realized, and this is, I think, uh, another really important part about this conception of the democracy movement, is that in order for us to succeed, it has to be uh, a grand coalition. It has to be a movement of movements. It has to be that everyone has, I, you know, everyone has their own focus. I mean, everyone has the, the issues that they care about the most, and that's great. But, and, and, and you should keep at that. But when the call goes out, you got to come in. Um, so, you know, one of my favorite, I'm deviating a little bit from the question, but this kind of goes back to, you know, trying to conceptualize why there's so much suffering, is when, you know, there's a group called Democracy Initiative, that's a coalition of, of 60 some odd groups that represents 30 million members, um, including the NAACP, Sierra Club, Common Cause, and all stuff, and they have this idea that they come together and focus on democracy. They'd all focus on their, their single issue passions, but when the time came, they'd all seek a different democracy. And similarly, when the call came out for the other, the other issues, everyone would participate. It's a real movement of movements, and it's to alleviate suffering. So when I do this work, I'm, I'm marching for people of all issue nationals, uh, because I see that this, this really is, is, is the issue to address all other issues. Um, and until that happens, uh, we're going to have still suffering, and that's unacceptable. I had no idea how to do this. I, I, it would require many years of expensive psychotherapy to, to figure this out. Um, but I still, after 25 years, I'm, I'm just still angry at, at polluters, and I, and I just refuse to let them lose. Sometimes, have you ever seen that my Python Holy Grail movie where the knight and the guy gets his arms sliced up just with my sweat? Sometimes I feel like that. But honestly, I, I don't know. Um, I have no idea where it comes from. Uh, Representative, there's a, a group that I've seen many times in, in Harrisburg in the state capitol. I, I know you've seen them as well. They're, they're a group of landowners uh, from all over the state. And they have, oh, you can take it from here. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's and, and um, in the slides that I have, we talk about the landowners association because, I mean, I think they are the people who have leased their land to the drillers under the promise that they would get a certain percent of the royalties. And uh, by a manipulation, some of the companies, I mean, Chesapeake has made it one of the most notorious, they, they uh, by just adding in a lot of the gobbledygook production costs and so forth, they said, well, your check this month is, you know, $4, or, or you owe us money. And, and, and uh, the, the, 
There is a bill that, this is the third term that's been introduced, Garth Everett from um, Lycoming County, nice guy, he's a Republican, but he's still a nice guy, um, introduces this bill that would guarantee a 12.5% royalty payment. And it's a very good bill. And, and I watched this bill move its way through the committee, move its way to the voting schedule, move its way, poised for a house vote. And then like a bad movie, it, and I see the land of these nice landowner people, they come to the committee meetings, they cheer the bill on, they talk to us. And I just, I know it's how, I know how it's gonna end. It always stops at that point. And, and, and I, I just wanna say to these people, don't, that you know what we're up against? The, the money that, that these, these, these companies give to the leaders who control the flow of legislation to people like Terzai and, and, and others who control, I mean, it's, it's, it's really part of the problem, the fact that um, good people um, who do their best just are stymied by the money of some special interest groups in Harrisburg. Is that what you're referring to? They, they break my heart every time I see them. Um, Representative, I would like to ask you another question. Um, something that I picked up on in the legislature is that if you choose to uh, not participate, not go to the dinners, not, not smoke the cigars in the back rooms, not go to the Penn State games and, and take the sideline passes to the Steelers games and all that, that your bills are likely to not go anywhere. I would, I would say uh, that there's, a, there's a couple of things to be, be, be said about that. It's kind of a funny story because I, you know, I live 100 miles away in Denver Town, and I, uh, and uh, my friend John right now, um, and I, I go drive home every night to an empty house. I live alone to an empty house in Havertown, and reps, you know, comparable distance to a wife and four kids stay up in, in Harrisburg. And uh, I think what I lose, you, you lose the networking, you lose the, um, you, 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 because a lot of times bills are passed through personal relationships, not, you know, the merits or not how hard you work or how strong your arguments are. It's just this personal relationships. You know, I like this guy, I give me yes, but if you tell me he's a jerk, I'll give him up. So I think um, I, I think the not participating in that, and I, I just say this to new legislators as they start the process. I mean, this is the, you have to choose what role you want. And I, I just I get up early, I do my policy stuff. Five o'clock, I go for a run, I go home, have my dinner, you know, get up, read the paper, have my coffee. I just don't. I don't want to associate or be with lobbyists or staffers or, or other legislators. I just have had enough. But you, you pay a price for that. Um, I, I think. Um, but the issue of whose whose bills move, and I think a lot of it is just um, the type of bills you choose. I mean, I, I get very few bills passed ever. I mean, I think I got last bill I had was like. Right away, sure, like not. But if, you, if your goal life is to make the crimes code tougher, you know, you, you can have a prolific career of just, you know, just increasing sentence after sentence. So part of it's that. I think um, I think I'm rambling at this point, but I don't think I, I, I don't, I don't sense I got to the gist of your question either, though. Um, but. Thank you. So. Um, I think everybody on this panel, I think you are all people of, of service, people of, of responsibility. And uh, the work is hard, and, and the day is long, and the hour is short. And I've noticed, you know, since I've started in this work, that there are moments of real joy, that there, there are moments of real satisfaction, there are moments of real meaning when trying to improve our democracy, when trying to bring people in, when trying to struggle against forces that are doing damage. Um, but there's moments of joy from a relationship, uh, moments of joy from um, you know, just the, the work itself. And so I'm just wondering if, if anybody would like to uh, describe a, a moment of joy that they've had while, while doing this work. <laughs> well, okay, I have, I have. Uh, Under Rindell, he had a, and, and if, if I didn't get this, if I 
I wasn't a part of this, I took all my career. He had an energy independence strategy where we got about a $600 million bond passed for uh, renewable energy projects. We got uh, a biofuels bill passed, which was really helpful in adding you know, non-fossil fuel content to gasoline. We got smart meters done. Um, it was a, um, one other piece to that too, it was a really huge environmental win. It, it meant something, and that's and that's kind of like when people say, "What did you ever do?" <laughs> I said, "Well, this is one thing I was part of," and uh, so that's my moment of joy. I can tell you, uh, last Tuesday we had a lobby day in Harrisburg, and we had about 300 people show up for a press conference on the Capitol steps, and then they went and met with legislators and staffers. Preparing for that was. Um, an amazingly stressful thing because almost none of them had been in the Capitol building. Almost none of them had ever met with a legislator. And so the stress over how do you set up the appointment, what do you do when you get there, what if they ask me a question, um, how are we going to find our way to the offices, there was so much um, stress. And the day itself was gorgeous, uh, it was beautiful, blue sky, people were just so excited to get their t-shirts and gather on the Capitol steps. And the energy throughout the day was just really wonderful. It, it was this sense of, this is our place. This is ours. We're part of this thing. And a, a group of our, our folks um, were gathering behind the Capitol building, waiting. There was one group that had, ordered, that had gotten a, a small bus to take them back and forth. They were waiting for their bus to pick them up. And the governor was there doing a meet and greet with some, some Capitol staffers. And they got a photo there with the governor. And the energy in that day was just that, this is our deal. We're part of this thing in a way that none of them a year ago would ever have pictured that they were part of what happens in that place. And it's, it's kind of transformative. It's, it's, it's intoxicating. It's, yeah, there are things that are happening that I don't like, but I am not going to let it happen. I'm going to be part of this thing. I'm going to follow this through. And find a way to change it, and I, I am part of democracy. And if democracy goes down, it's because I didn't do my piece, and it's not going to go down because we're all going to show up, and we're going to make sure it goes the right direction. Uh, there's one other. You asked the picture in your head. There's one other picture I wanted to share. I don't know how many of you have seen the Lord of the Rings movies, but Gandalf. There's a scene. Um, they're down in the Nether World, and that awful. What's that? That. Yeah, that thing. I can't even say. It. That awful thing is kind of coming up out of the deep. It's kind of awakened and it's coming up out of the deep and all of the hobbits and all of those are, you know, they're terrified. And Gandalf plants himself in the middle of this bridge, narrow way, and says, you shall not pass. And I love that image of there's a moment when we have to grasp that moral authority and just look evil in the eye and say, no, you don't get to do this. This is going to stop. And I, I think that's the other thing that motivates me is that sense of, at a certain point, we all just need to stand up and say, no, you don't get away with this. You don't get to do this. This is not the way this country is going. We've seen this happen in other places. It's not happening here. You will not pass. This will not pass. You're not getting away with it. And if I have to go and knock on every door on my street to say, get out here with me and stand here, you're not getting away with it. That's, that's another piece that motivates me pretty strongly. Well, I had many, many joys, but I'll just say the most recent one is that, uh, you know, I decided to hop on a plane uh, from Boston and come down to Philadelphia on a whim, somewhat of a whim, uh, you know, because Michael told me last year that he wanted to plan this, and I was incredibly excited that he went through with it. Um, and the idea of coming into Philadelphia with some old faces that I knew from last year um, and people that I had never met, never would have met, and to be welcomed in such a kind of loving way, uh, people I didn't know and getting to know them um, and becoming friends with them um, is, is for me what it's all about. Um, you know, walking with the folks uh, on the march in Harrisburg is, is, I was so worried that it would be, you know, that this, something it would be different, you know, I did Democracy Spring, you know, I was involved in organizing, you know, 
us. And I was like, is this going to be you know, one of those really bad sequels that disaster happens? Um, you know, is this going to be like a, a rerun that I should, shouldn't have done? Um, but uh, I was wrong. It's not the same. But it's good. It's different. And it's just as good. You know? and, and, and that's what it's all about. Um, it's about being people you know, and, and fighting for our rights and coming together.